Hi, everyone. So before I begin, let me thank the organizers again for inviting me to participate in this, in this online conference. So this talk is going to be the, the first of a series of three talks that I'm giving on singularities of the Lagrangian mean curvature flu. So this is talk number, number one. And uh, everything that I'm going to discuss is, is joint work with Jason Lotte and Felix Schulze. So in this talk, I'm going to give a kind of background, some minimal background that we need to know about the Lagrangian mean curvature flu to, to understand the, this topic. Okay, so primarily I, I'll be working in, in CN, but really the, the most interesting situation would be say in a compact Calabi yeah, manifold. And also in most of these talks, the most of the time will be in two dimensions. Okay, but for simplicity, let's just work in CN. So we have the standard symplectic form, little omega, and we have the standard holomorphic N0 form, capital omega. So this is the, the basics of the Calabi Yao structure on CN. Now, so quickly, let's run over some definitions. So uh, a submanifold inside CN is Lagrangian if it has if it's real n dimensional, so it has exactly half the dimension, and the symplectic form vanishes when restricted to m. So it turns out that actually this is the equivalent to saying that if we take this holomorphic n zero form, we restrict it to m, and then take take its norm with respect to the Euclidean metric, then then this is one. It turns out that this, this is always less than or equal to one, and it's equal to one exactly for Lagrangians. Well, so in particular, we can compare the holomorphic N0 form when restricted to M. So this is some N form on M, and we can, uh, we can compare that with the volume form of M. So I'm implicitly assuming that M is oriented. And then these will be related by some unit complex number at each point. So now we call the Lagrangian zero Maslov if this unit complex number can be defined sort of globally as a, as a, as a e to the i theta for a real valued function. And this is the case, then we call theta the Lagrangian angle or the, the grading of M. And then M is special Lagrangian if this Lagrangian angle is constant. So in a minute, we'll see that this has uh, an equivalent uh, definition in terms of the mean curvature. But okay, so the, the basic question that motivates all of this work is the following. If you're given some Lagrangian M, say inside CN or in the Calabia manifold, is it possible to find some other, in some sense, equivalent Lagrangian which happens to be special Lagrangian. So are there sort of special represented, special Lagrangian representatives of suitable equivalence classes? So of course, equivalent can be thought, you know, understood in different ways, like the simplest maybe uh, you, we want a special Lagrangian in the same homology class as M. So this turns out to be not, not such a well-behaved problem. And maybe a slightly better one is find a Lagrangian, a special Lagrangian in the same Hamiltonian isotopy class. So can we deform M to a, by Hamiltonian isotopy to a special Lagrangian? But it turns out that that's also not, not so good. So currently the, the, the equivalence class that, that, that we tend to study is that that two Lagrangians should define the same object in the, the derived Bukaya category. But th this may also not exactly be the right thing. So we, we don't really know what equivalent should be. But in any case, the, the sort of program that I'm concerned with in these talks is the following, going back to Thomas and Yao, and refined and elaborated greatly by, by Dominic Joyce. So very roughly speaking, the conjecture says that the, the way that we should try to find an, an equivalent special Lagrangian to M is to run the, the mean curvature flu. 
with initial condition M and then see what happens. So the Joyce conjecture is a sort of detailed picture describing how one could try to run the mean curvature of flu through singularities with various surgeries and eventually hope to decompose M into, into special Lagrangians. So this is a very vague statement. You, know, you, you should certainly look at Joyce's paper on the topic to see the, the more precise version. Okay, so let me say something basic about mean curvature flu. I hope that everyone has maybe seen some, some talks on this before. So roughly speaking, the mean curvature flu is it can be thought of as a, an evolution equation for submanifolds, which tries to uh, decrease the area in, in the most efficient way. It's, it's basically the negative gradient flu for the, the area functional. It can be written in this form. So it, one can calculate that the thing you should do is to evolve M in the direction of its mean curvature, H. Now, there is this amazing interplay between the Lagrangian and this the, so the symplectic geometry and this sort of metric geometry uh, encoded in this relation. So it turns out that the mean curvature is the same as J nabla theta. So remember, theta was a function on M. Now you take the gradient of this function in, in terms of the induced Riemannian metric on M or MT. So this will be a, a vector field tangent to M. And then you apply J, where J is the complex structure on CM. And because MT is Lagrangian, this J will transform a tangent vector in, into a normal vector to MT. So in fact, this J nabla uh, theta will be normal to MT. And one can compute that it's exactly the mean curvature when you're thinking of MT as a, a submanifold in Euclidean space. Okay, so th this has two consequences. So first of all, it says that the mean curvature flow by this formula is evolving MT in, in this direction, J nabla theta. But, but these are exactly what Hamiltonian isotopies are generated by, so th these kind of, of, of vector fields deforming the submanifold. So this formula tells us that all the MTs will be Hamiltonian isotopic, and moreover, the stationary points to the, the static solutions of this flu, which are just the, the minimal submanifolds, they are exactly the same as when nabla theta is zero, i.e. theta is constant. So special Lagrangians are the, the, the stationary points. Okay, so the, the this program would be to start with some M and then try to deform it along the this mean curvature flow and, and hope for the best. Well, it turns out that singularities are, are almost certainly unavoidable and, and they, they, they are not just some technical uh, nuisance, but in fact, they should play some fundamental role in describing which Lagrangians can be deformed to a special Lagrangians and which cannot. Okay, so singularity analysis is the, the heart of the matter here. So let me say a few words on how do we, like what, what are the basic ideas in analyzing singularities of this kind of flu? Okay, so imagine that what's happening is you're evolving your manifold, everything is nice until some positive time, capital T, at which point the, the, the mean curvature or the, the second fundamental form blows up at some space, at some point in space X. So basically we have a singularity at this space time point X, T. Okay, so to understand the singularity, what we can do is perform a rescaling, basically extract a kind of a, a kind of blow up to you know to see what's happening at some small scales. So to do a very general blow up, we can take a sequence of scales going to infinity. We can take a sequence of points converging to x and a sequence of times converging to capital T. And probably it's a good idea to, to, to take these times less than t. So we're looking at times where the, the, the flow is not yet singular. 
Okay, so given these three sequences, for each k, we can consider this rescaled flow. So this is exactly just the parabolic scaling. So you can see that when, when s, so s will be the new time variable. When s is 0, then we're really just looking at m t k. We're translating bit by. So you're, we're making this x k the new kind of the new origin. And then we're rescaling by lambda k. And then yeah, so this, you can see that basically we're scaling time by lambda k and sorry, space by lambda k and time by lambda k squared. So th this is the, the parabolic scaling, which will again result in a solution of mean curvature flow. So now we have the sequence Lk of mean curvature flows. And then there is a very general you know, compactness theory uh, analogous to you know, similar results for Einstein metrics or minimal submanifolds which tells us that along a subsequence, as k goes to infinity, we can obtain some kind of weak limit L infinity. So this L infinity will be what is called a, a Bracky flow. And that's, you, know, you should just think of it as some sort of possibly singular solution of the mean curvature flow. Okay, so this L, this L infinity is describing what our original flow looks like at smaller and smaller scales as we approach the singular point. There are two sort of, well, there, there's one, one main special case. It's when you choose all of your, your base points along the sequence to simply be the singular point, capital X, capital T. And in this case, any limit that you obtain in this way is called a tangent flow at the singularity. So this is the kind of first order information that, that one can extract. It's like the, the, the tangent line to a curve, for example. And one of the fundamental problems is whether this A can be replaced by V, i.e. does the tan is the tangent flow unique at a given singular point, or is it does it depend on the sequence of Ks that you chose? The compactness theory will just give you a subsequence. OK, so in this very special case, we get what are called the tangent flows. And these have important sort of self-similarity properties. But it's also very important to look at these more general uh, blow-ups, so where you allow the base point to vary. And then you, get, you can get all kinds of different things. For example, you could always rescale at different points in a way to make the curvature bounded. And then you get what's called a type 2 blow-up. So the type 2 blow-up will be something that's that's smooth and, and, and not flat, and that it's extracted by somehow always rescaling by, by, by the, curva, the, the curvature. Okay, let me, let me give a, a, a quick example. So a very special case of mean curvature flow is when you take curves in a surface. And in fact, this is an example of Lagrangian uh, mean curvature flow, since any one-dimensional submanifold and C is, is Lagrangian. Okay, so there is a well understood example of singularity formation here when you have one of these one of these loops. So this would be part, you know, your curve could do something different over there. So if your curve has a piece like this, then typically what will happen is that this the, this loop will get smaller and smaller, and there will be some singular time at which it gets collapsed to a point. And at that time, the curvature blows up because your, your curve will have, have some sort of cusp singularity. OK, so let's say that we're studying this singular point xt right here. So now we could try to extract different blow up limits. So here are some examples of what can happen. OK, so the tangent flow, remember, is obtained where at each time we take this to be our base point. So it's not totally obvious from the picture where that will be at these earlier times. I mean, you could imagine maybe this intersection is a good point to focus on. But okay, it, it's, not, it's not totally clear which points will correspond to the same exact point. However, it turns out that essentially because the, the, this loop shrinks much more quickly in this direction than in this direction, what will happen is that the whole picture collapses to, to a double line. 
if so if you rescale in this so if, if you choose these as your base points so then you could do other things so for example if you choose the base points always to be like say here like in the middle of this loop and you rescale in such a way as to make these two pieces so that sort of the top and bottom of this loop to be at a fixed distance, then it's not hard to see that you'll end up with a limit that's just given by these two, two parallel lines, just a, a static flow of two parallel lines. Now, if you rescale in such a way that you take your base points to be these, the, the sort of most curvy part of this loop, and then you rescale in such a way as to make the curvature be fixed, say curvature equal to one at, at these points, then it turns out that what you get is this so-called Grim Reaper. So this is the translator which just moves along in, in this direction. And so that that's the, the, the this is the the flow that models or the, what what happens around around this tip as the singularity is forming. And you can do other things too, like just take some points again, like here, like these points, and then just rescale by even bigger quantities than we did before. So you just scale everything else away, and then the limit will be a multiplicity one line. Okay, and then the, the hope is that if you understand all possible blow up limits, then that should give you a, a pretty good geometric picture of, of how the singularity is forming. Okay, so there is a fundamental result due to Neves, which says that in Lagrangian mean curvature flow, if you impose the zero mass law condition, or so if you have these gradings, and let, let me not write that so had some technical assumptions about having uniformly bounded area ratios and uniformly bounded Lagrangian angles, but then all tangent flows are unions of special Lagrangian cones. So in particular, they're, they're all going to be the cones, so they're invariant under dilation. So this is vastly different from what you, you see, for example, for mean curvature flow of surfaces in, in R3, where one of the very standard singularities is modeled on the just the uh, shrinking sphere. So that, that would be one standard tangent flow, or shrinking cylinders, neither of which are conical. So this is a very special feature of the Lagrangian setup. So for example, when we're in C2, which is what we're going to do for most of the time, all the tangent flows are actually unions of planes. They're unions of Lagrangian planes. OK, so the as I said, the, the tangent flow is the first piece of information. And what you'd like to say is, well, given a certain tangent flow, what can I say about how the singularity is forming? You know, can I continue the flow after the singularity? If something, you know, if I cannot, then and why is that? Like, could I have done something before? So, I mean, one, the, the strategy that we've, we've been looking at is to just start taking the simplest examples and try to see what can we say about the singularities with given tangent flows. And C2, they're all unions of planes. So the simplest case is a single multiplicity one plane, but that, that implies that there's actually no singularity. So the, the next case would be two planes. And then the simplest option seems to be two transverse planes. The next one is two planes meeting along a line, and, and so, so on and so forth. So this is what motivates the, the results that I will discuss. OK, so in the next two lectures, we'll be discussing basically two results. Both of these are joint work with Jason Lotte and Felix Schulze. And so again, there are some technical assumptions. We need uniformly banded area ratios, Lagra uh, banded Lagrangian angle. We also need uh, at least rational or exactness, which I, I won't really spend much time on. For example, if the, if you have simply connected flows, oh, sorry, simply you fl you're flowing simply connected surfaces, then the exactness is, is automatic. Okay, so the first result is the following. So suppose that you 
your, your singularity that you meet is such that one tangent flow is given by a union of two transverse planes with, with multiplicity one. Then the really the main result is that this, the, this tangent flow is unique. As I said, this uniqueness is really one of the fundamental questions in, in this area. And then as, as a, a essentially a consequence of this, one can show that the flu will undergo something called an, a neck pinch. So this you can just visualize as looking at this family of complex hyperbola, ZW equals epsilon as epsilon goes to zero. So as you can see this, well, in the limit, you, you just get two planes. Okay, so this is perhaps the, the simplest kind of singularity that that we would like to understand. And then next, suppose that the tangent flow or a tangent flow is any union of two planes. So it could be a double plane, two planes meeting along a line, etc. Then what we see is that any blow up limit, so any, it not, not just the, the tangent flow, but any way that you blow up around a singular point, what you get will be always either static, so for example, a special Lagrangian, or a translator, okay? And then, of course, the, the, the further questions would be, you know, for basically classify these a little bit more. So I, I, I might talk about that a little bit when I'm actually discussing this result, but you should see that this is a little bit similar to what we saw over here. So all the possible blowups that we saw in this curve shortening flow case were either static, like a double line, two, uh, two parallel lines, or all, also this multiplicity one line, or, or a translator like this Grim Reaper. And notice that this, this does not have to be the case in general. Like this is not, a, this is not some very general result that blowups are always like static or translators. So this is some, something very special to the Lagrangian mean curvature flu. Okay, so these are the results that I'd like to discuss in the next two lectures. So in the next lecture, I will talk about these neck pinches, and then in the, the last lecture, I'll discuss this, the, this other result, which is essentially a kind of classification result for, for ancient solutions. Okay, thanks for, for listening.